So the question to me is, is why do things happen in history at a particular time? Why? Why didn't the first wave feminism happen 300 years before or 300 years later? Well, um, well, first wave feminism came around as the result of the Industrial Revolution, that there were now excess resources enough to the point where women didn't have to um, tee up and queue up a man uh, in order to uh, have a life, right? And look, there are women out there who are stone geniuses, who don't want to have kids and who can compete with the best men on the planet. No doubt. I mean, it's a bell curve. There are fewer of them than there are of the men at the top tier, just as there are fewer women than men at the bottom tier, right? The crazy, homeless, whatever, right? Um, nature rolls <laughs> the, the, the uh, dice with lot, lots greater numbers when she creates a man's brain than with a woman's brain, but nonetheless. So there are women out there who were really frustrated. Now, throughout most of human history, they would have to settle down and, and have kids because you have to provide uh, a man with sexual access and children in order to get his resources. And there really wasn't much point in the Middle Ages having a feminist movement because women were constantly burdened with pregnancy and breastfeeding and pregnancy and breastfeeding. And it was sort of completely pointless to have any kind of feminist movement. Now, when excess resources were created and we moved above bare subsistence in the, in the 19th century, 18th and 19th century, um, you can say 18th was the agricultural revolution, which everyone forgets about, which I wrote a whole novel about called Just Poor. But um, the agricultural revolution led to the excess food that allowed for the urbanization and the um, factor, factories uh, and all of that in, in the cities. Because you can't have cities if you don't have excess food and you can't have excess food without private property and innovation in the countryside. So... When you started to get excess resources, then it became possible for women to either outsource, uh, because only the aristocracy could outsource child raising, right? I mean, in the French Revolution, I mean, there were these terrible wet nurses who were just brutal to kids. But, you know, women would have kids and hand them over to poor uh, women to to breastfeed like cattle. Uh, and then, you know, you but, but it became more common, more um, possible as wealth spread and as you got a middle class to outsource your child raising, which allowed women to free themselves from the shackles of maternalism and go out into the marketplace and, and write and, you know, George Sand and all these wonderful things that went on uh, and do all of the, and it's great. You know, I've no, I've no problem with that other than I, I think if, you, if you're going to have kids, you should raise them yourself. I don't, I don't get married in order to travel the world and have affairs. And I don't see why people would have kids and then not raise them themselves. But anyway, uh, so the excess resources allowed. Now, the question is, why didn't the feminists, the first wave feminists say, hey, man, Thanks for the last 150,000 years, man. That was really great. You know, you all fighting off the saber-toothed tigers, inventing fire and learning how to cook meat and learning how to keep us safe and building a civilization and, and keeping all of the other men of the other tribe who want to ravage us uh, off, off our backs or fronts or sides or whatever <laughs> their particular local preference is. Thanks a lot, man. Um, and, and thanks for this free market stuff. Uh, so, you know, we, we'd really like some more rights now that it's sort of possible and, and useful and, and, and helpful for us to have them. Uh, good job getting us here. Well done. Well, they didn't say that. What they said, of course, was not, well, now we have the excess resources that allow us to do all of this great stuff in the marketplace and to participate politically, and we want equality under the law, and we want our rights of own contract. And fantastic, right? We're going to be entrepreneurs. Great, because there's enough excess resources that women can do more than just barely survive having kids. But they didn't do that because feminism came out of the left. And what the left does, of course, is it never says capitalism has produced good things which now give us more choices like female emancipation and uh, uh, female suffrage and all of that kind of stuff. What they do is they say, well, women have always had this possibility, but the capitalists have kept them down. They've ground them down. It's sexism against women, right? They just have to invent this past where somehow magically female emancipation, equality under the law, all of these things were somehow could have been present, but were, were kept down by this evil patriarchy. Because right? they can't say, wow, the free market uh, that has grown in the 18th and 19th century has really produced these wonderful excesses that now give women a lot more opportunities and choices than they used to have. And by the way, it wasn't like in the Middle Ages, men had a lot of fantastic choices either. Hey, do you want to fight in the King's War? No, we're going to kill you. Hey, <laughs> do you uh, do you want to have the same occupation your father had? No, we're going to kill you. I mean, <laughs> like men had all these great choices. I uh, feel like not having plague. No, sorry, you get plague, you're dead. So this, because it came out of the left, it couldn't say good job capitalism and work to give women the opportunities uh, in the free market that capitalism had generated the excess resources to allow. No, they had, because they were from the left, they had damn capitalism, which meant they had to paint this portrait backwards that somehow there was this horrible patriarchy all throughout history that kept women down. And now only that the socialists have come along, are women going to get any equality? You can see the same stuff that happens with the races as well and all that, right? So 
So that's important. The fact, of course, that throughout history uh, in the West, rape was illegal and women weren't drafted and men got killed in wars and women had longer lifespans and women were protected and you know, women and children first in the lifeboats and all that. I mean, the, the, the fact that women were elevated and protected and all of that is, of course, completely erased from history because you have to make women angry and resentful and that way you can start to undo the family, which is the foundation of the free market. So, so that happened. And now the second wave was came out of a denial of biological reality, which is if you give women freedom, most of them won't really take it in the way that you want it, right? <laughs> because a lot of the feminists were like, women are exactly the same as men. And so when we give women freedom, women should behave exactly like men, <laughs> right? And it's like, that makes so little sense. I can't even tell you. It makes no sense at all. Uh, so the feminists have a particular way that they want women to use their freedom, which is like a a sort of um, uh, Gertrude Stein brainiac lesbian, right? I mean, and you know, brainiac lesbians should be out there doing wonderful things in the world. I have no problem with that at all. I think it would be fantastic. However, most women are not brainiac lesbians in the same way that most men are not Milo Yiannopoulos, right? I mean, so, um, so when women were given freedom, it was because the women who most wanted the freedom expected all the other women to do what they did, and they didn't. Right, particularly in post, sort of post-war period in the 1950s and so on, they were like, oh, great, you know, let's go have six kids because that's what's going to make me fulfilled and happy and you know, pursue this wonderful life as a, as a wife and mother and, and uh, as a charity worker and as the cohesive glue that keeps the neighborhood humming and running and so on, right? And, and this got really frustrating because the feminists were like, well, wait a minute, we didn't fight over all this freedom for you to do what your grandmother did. We fought for all this freedom so you could do exactly what I did. And uh, this is one big problem. I haven't talked about this in years, so I'll just sort of mention it here. And I appreciate your patience, Jennifer. I'll only be another four days, and then you can uh, you can chime in. But um, intellectuals look at factory workers, and what they do is they project themselves into the lives of those factory workers and say, "These people are having a horrible, horrible existence." Um, on, on Econ Talk uh, years ago, I was listening to a guy who was a writer for some hoity-toity magazine, and he went to work at Walmart. And he worked there for, I don't know, a week or two uh, to, to do research for his article. And then he said, you know, I basically had to quit because it was driving me crazy, right? So really intelligent people look at factory workers and say, oh, these people have, because they think everyone's the same. And so they do, they say, well, if I were doing that job with that machine for that long, I'd go crazy. And therefore, these people must be going crazy and we must go and free them. It's like, no, you know, they wouldn't want your life and you don't want their life. That doesn't mean that either life is wrong. There are some people perfectly fine for factory work. They've got an IQ of 90 or 95 and they go to work and the time flies for them because they don't mind repetitive tasks. And then they go uh, and watch their kids' baseball games and they have a barbecue and then they watch TV and they go to bed. They get up and do it again the next night. Now, an intellectual would go crazy with that kind of life. But you put this guy in the library all day, he's going to go insane too, right? So, um, this idea that everyone should make our own choices, everyone should make the choices that we value is obviously just narcissism and is complete lack of understanding, sorry, of the bell curve of human uh, achievement and human potential. So I sort of wanted to, to mention that sort of an important thing because the feminists, uh, first wave feminists, second wave feminists, they fought for all these freedoms and then they found that women were not conforming to the freedoms that they thought they should. And so what happened was they'd say, well, we want women to be able to go into engineering Okay, fine. I mean, there really wasn't much point having women come into engineering in the past because the cost-benefit ratio wasn't that great. Because if you have all of these women coming into engineering, then you have a whole different set of circumstances. Um, so why, wouldn't, why weren't women invited into engineering in the past? Just said law or law or whatever, right? Well, I mean, even in Phyllis Schlafly's day, post-Second World War, I mean, she had to fight pretty hard to get into higher education. And the reason why is, is pretty obvious. Uh, number one, um, if you're going to start letting women into uh, engineering, just take engineering, well, then you have to build extra bathrooms and you're going to have cultural problems and you're going to have people dating and it's going to be inefficient and the women are going to find men that they want to fall in, fall in love with them and the men are going to fall in love with women they're going to get married and the women, because there's no particular birth control and there generally is, don't have sex until you get married, the women will get married, the men will be distracted and you're going to end up with way fewer engineers per dollar of investment, right? So if you've got a, you know, a $10 million engineering faculty that produces 100 engineers a year, uh, if they're men, well, you know, a bunch of them will bomb out. Maybe you'll get 80, right? But if you have women and men mixed in, well, the men are going to get married to the women. The women are going to get married to the men. The men are going to be distracted by the women. The women are going to be distracted by the men. And you might only get 60 engineers coming out who are going to be able to stay in the field, right? Because you got knocked up and you got married, got knocked up. It's going to have kids. 
So it was negative. Oh, plus you got to build women's bathrooms and, you know, all this other kind of stuff that, that goes on. And, um, and everyone's going to have to watch what they say and <laughs> lack of creative free flow uh, and all that. And, um, and uh, so, and also the women, you know, they might do badly and cry. <laughs> Sorry, Tim Hunt. Maybe it's true. So it just, it didn't make any sense for society to have women go into engineering because you just ended up with fewer engineers at a time where society desperately needed. Now, when society has a lot of extra resources, yeah, sure, fine, people can LARP as engineers all they want, but um, it's still bad for the economy, but it's just not as obvious and noticeable. And so what happened was they fought for all of these freedoms and then the freedoms did not materialize statistically, right? Women are half the population. Women didn't become half the engineers. Women are half the population. Women didn't become half the lawyers or lumberjacks or fishermen or, you know, whatever. Although it always seems to be the positive and um, safe occupations that women want to get into. You don't say, well, where, where are the people cutting down trees? So, or miners. Why aren't half the women miners? Let's go get some grimy. Plumbers. <laughs> grimy. Plumber. Yeah, plumbers and all that kind of stuff, right? If you're going to see a plumber's crack, I, I'd rather it be not on hairy kind. But anyway, um, so all of this stuff didn't materialize. So then rather than – because they were anti-reality, anti-free market. So all disparities result from exploitation. That's sort of the mantra of the left. All numerical disparities do not result from biology, do not result from genetics, do not result from different choices. All disparities result from exploitation and – it's evil, and the government must rush in to fix this exploitation. So first wave feminists, yeah, equality under the law, voting rights, and blah, blah, blah. Second wave feminists were like, wait a minute, we're not getting the numbers we want. So what's the problem, ladies? Why not? And then they say, well, the problem is that women are getting married, so let's shit all over marriage. Oh, the problem is that women are getting pregnant, so let's promote birth control and let's promote sleeping around without getting pregnant. Oh, this, oh, that. Right? And they started breaking down all these barriers and trying to turn women into men with all the resulting dysfunction, neurosis, and frankly, uh, psychotropic medications for women and men that, that result from that. And say, oh, well, the problem is women, women are taking care of children. Women are actually being mothers, which we're not because we're, I don't know, genius lesbians or whatever. And so we're going to get the government to take over daycare. And then now the women can be free and we're going to get maternity leave. It's going to be paid for by men because men pay taxes and women collect the resources from, from the government. And so they just say, oh, we got to break down all these barriers. Oh, is it that women are getting pregnant? Great. Let's have abortion. And that way women can kill the fetuses in the womb. And that way they can go back to work and we can get these numbers to match. Now, it never works. It never works. It hasn't worked now. Um, and it's not going to ever work in the future because nature has so ordained it that women like being moms. Uh, a lot of women like being moms. Now, the next wave feminism, uh, I would assume, um, is, uh, and so third wave, so first wave feminism is equality of opportunity. And second wave feminism is removing the barriers to equality of outcome. Third wave feminism is just saying, to hell with it. We're just going to use the government to force equality of outcome. We're going to have equal pay for work of equal value. We're going to have all these subsidies go to women, all these uh, promote women stuff and all. We're just, we're just going to move. And we're not going to have an even playing field. We're going to tilt it towards women to get the same numerical outcomes. It's not going to work. So what happens then, of course, is that there's even more totalitarian things put into place. Uh, in order to try and get this equality of outcome. Now, they don't care. The feminists don't care about equality of outcome, but they care that people care about inequality of outcome. And they, this is the, why they do two things. Number one, they always say that this government power, more government power will solve this problem of, in, of inequality, quote, inequality, right? And second, uh, they say uh, the free market is is the problem, needs to be uh, curtailed. So, um, and, but they don't, they don't actually care about equality of outcome because, you know, they've been at it for 150 years. They still don't have equality of outcome and they're not changing any of their basic principles. So um, this is what the left does, right? They, they reject choice and they reject biology. They reject genetics. They reject basic reality. And then they say, well, all that inequality is the result of exploitation, which makes the people on the downside of the bell curve feel annoyed and the people at the upside of the bell curve feel guilty. And that's a perfect storm for the transfer of resources, the expansion of state power. So, yeah, I mean, you know, they, they kind of, they'll never achieve equality between the genders because of, of childbirth. They just will never achieve equality between the genders. Now, when childbirth is taken out of the equation, when marriage and childbirth is taken out of the equation, well, that's fine. Then, then women actually earn a little bit more than men when uh, marriage and uh, unmarried women with no kids, uh, they make the same as the men. But of course, if you're if a young woman gets married, uh, the risk of her wanting to become a mom is pretty high. So you're going to have to discount that as you go forward. Women who have children 
if they are remotely responsible, have to leave and go and pick them up from school or from daycare and just not available to work all night. I mean, it's nothing wrong with it. It's beautiful. It's a wonderful thing. Um, and it is why we continue to have a society at some point. But, um, you know, the way they can't even keep drugs out of prisons, they will, even if, if the government becomes completely totalitarian, they will never be able to erase these uh, inequalities. Uh, and um, it's important to remember, again, they don't care about equality. They care about the perception of inequality in order to destroy the free market and to portray choice and biology as somehow re regressive and exploitive. Uh, and that's my sort of brief sprint through the waves, if that makes sense. And let me just mention one other thing. It's just sort of an example of, of how disastrous all this stuff is and, and how uh, the feminists have no, no interest in helping women. They just only have interest in destroying freedom and, and disposing of the free market. You know, if, if you really, and if you're patient, right, if you, if you want to destroy a society, it's, it's very easy to do. Uh, all you do is you convince, well, you do two things. Number one is you create entitlement programs that must be funded by the young. And number two, you convince women not to have children. It's as simple as that. Um, you, you, you get old age pensions and, and um, the old age uh, healthcare schemes. Uh, I can't remember if it's Medicare or Medicaid, but the old age pension, uh, pension schemes and healthcare schemes, which must be directly paid for by the young. And then you convince women not to have children. Well, you have just created a perfect storm a generation or so away. Uh, and we can see all of this happening now. It's been perfect uh, in terms of destroying the West because then the politicians panic. And what do they do? Well, they bring in third world people who start to undermine the entire freedoms that the European culture is, is built on. So it's fantastic. You know, there was this, um, uh, Italy is freaking out about its low birth rate and the government has sort of put out some posters, just you know, gently reminding women that fertility declines and all this kind of stuff. And of course, all the feminists come out screeching like harpies. Ah, you're just treating us like, like breeding cattle and ah, right? Yeah, that's right. Making a human life in your womb is exactly the same as giving birth to a cow. Well, I guess for mothers of family. Anyway, so so that's this sort of a basic reality. And and if you know feminists who are generally socialists who want these big giant government programs, they should say, okay, well, you've either got to crank up the taxes like crazy to pay for them, or in order to pay for these programs, then we better convince women to have a huge amount of children. But of course, feminists don't want to convince women to have a huge amount of children because then the explanation as to why there's a disparity in outcome becomes much more clear. If you have six children, it's not very likely you're going to end up being CEO of Pepsi. Down 5%, I might add, since our tweet went out. But anyway, um, so you don't want any of this. And then the temptation is to then say, well, you know, I guess feminists are not very good at math because they want all these big giant government programs that have to be paid for by the young, but then they convince women to not have children or to postpone it, which is kind of the same thing for a lot of women. So they want programs paid for by a generation that they have prevented from coming into being. And um, it, it, one way of saying, I guess the feminists aren't that good at math. Well, they probably aren't, but um, <laughs> they, uh, um, they're not interested in old age pensions. They're not interested in egalitarianism. They're just interested uh, in in destruction. They're just dedicated to the destruction of uh, freedom and uh, choice and, and liberty and property rights and so on. And uh, that's, that's how they roll, sometimes literally. I agree. I think there's there's a propensi propensity towards hatred. And, you know, in order to hate a man, you, you really have to hate children first. Mm. And so if you can convince someone to hate children, then you'll eventually convince them to hate the other sex. And I think that's some of the the root of what's going on between men and women. You know? Right. And to me, as long as the government is willing to borrow and overspend, then women can LARP as men, live action role play as men, as, as, as much as they want. And nobody can really talk about it. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it just doesn't really, uh, <laughs> it doesn't really mean anything to try and, the incentive has to change, right? So this is um, uh, a little bit of data I wanted to sort of point out, right? Uh, and I'm reading this from uh, a blog. We'll put the link below. Uh, legions of feminists will ferociously type smash the patriarchy at their internet rallies, calling out for the end of the male supremacy in all spheres of life. Yet few of them acknowledge the fact that one of these spheres, the government, the institution granting them rights, is entirely funded by male taxpayers. Economically, women cost more to the state than they benefit. The government is literally paying women to be alive. As such, strong, independent women are only that way because the state is transferring money from men to them. Feminists are not seriously against being dependent on men, 
they're just against men having the full control over their money. And and what I would say is that feminists are not against men being dependent, women being dependent on men. They just don't want any reciprocal responsibilities, right? right I mean, right. if you're going to be right, you right. you know, you're you're a mom, right? You right. you run the household, so <laughs> it's a it's a job, you know, it's a real job, and yes. it's a hugely important job. Um, while the seventy cent while the seventy seven cents for a dollar wage gap has been under the spotlight for the past years. The 200 cents for a dollar tax gap has, by knowledge, never been mentioned, at least not by our supreme feminist leaders, Barack Obama and Justin Trudeau. Uh, a quick glimpse of the data reveals a massive difference in taxes paid by men and women. The first thing that comes to mind is that half of women might be at home raising kids, and this is a graph here, right? Uh, and and the, what it basically works is direct tax per capita by age group and gender. This is from 2010. And... Um, Men are just paying way more taxes for way longer uh, than uh, than women. Uh, the workforce participation rate rate gap between men and women doesn't seem to exceed ten percent in the age groups uh, uh, as a whole. And um, with the exception of the age group between forty five and fifty nine, which is only a fifteen year span, women cost more to the state than the tax they provide. In contrast, men generate more tax revenue than they cost between twenty three and sixty five. A forty three year span is almost three times. So three times as long, men are producing more than they consume with regards to taxation and government services. In the brief period in which women generate more or as much tax money than they consume, the men outscore them by at least three times, right? So 300% more. Uh, by the end of her life, the average woman will have a negative fiscal impact of $150,000. And um, that's uh, pretty significant. Uh, men have an, a, a positive cumulative net fiscal impact from 40 until 80 years of, of age and so on. So ah, this is um, – and this is why feminists want a stronger government. The government wants women to work and not have children. Why? Because the government pays for children, but the government receives from women who pay taxes. So governments have bills to pay. They have, um, I guess, some small portion of their expenses to cover. And so governments want you, as a woman, to forego having children. Because when you have children, you're out of the workforce, not paying taxes. Governments have to provide more health care. Governments have to build more schools. Governments have to hire more teachers. And all of the existing politicians, given that it takes about a quarter century for somebody to become a taxpayer, all of the politicians in power, none of them will see the benefit of you having children in their political careers. Now, if they can convince you to, oh, have children later when my children's children are in office and I'm long dead. Have children later when the expense accrues to the state later and the benefits uh, uh, don't. Have them later. Of course, they're convincing you to have children later because they want your money now and they don't want the costs now and children are expensive. Children are very expensive. They are, you might as well just take money and... <laughs> flush it down a tiny porta potty and so recognize that the advice that you're getting from people about how to be a woman is terrible it is not disinterested advice right now so the government wants you to go to work and they'll pay a lot of people to tell you to go to work and have children later because they want your money now and they don't want the expense of having children now so they'll say oh yeah go to work now have children later. You're young. Go. You got a great brain. Go to work. Go to work. Give us some taxes. I mean, they're basically taking your ovaries hostage, probably never to <laughs> release them. And so that's important. Now, the radical feminists, or as they're also known as feminists, what they do is is they want you to go to work so that they can close the gender gap. That's why they want you to go to work. And also because they don't want you to be a happy mom and a housewife and all that kind of stuff because they're generally miserable, horrible human beings. So they want you to go to work to fulfill their ideological agenda. And uh, they, they're just running their own racket on you. The politicians are running their own racket. Pay us taxes. Don't cost us money. The feminists are running their own racket. The, the people who are uh, in um, media. And there are enormous swaths of human beings in the West who are single-mindedly, albeit often unconsciously, dedicated to destroying the West. It has been a 150-year process or more of trying to destroy the West. And there's been attacks on all fronts, and one of the fundamental fronts has been male-female relations. You see, if you want to destroy a culture, raise 
its children, in particular its sons, without father figures, without fathers. And you then end up with a set of men who are constantly deferring to women who, who can't patrol the perimeters of the tribe and keep it safe from incursion and keep it safe from outsiders and keep it safe from who would those who would come in to do the tribe harm. Uh, they're not particularly tough. Uh, and um, uh, when you put women in charge of boys and you don't lament at all the absence of fathers from little boys' lives, well, uh, in general, uh, the boys become shiftless uh, and lazy and unmotivated and the girls become promiscuous. Uh, this is, I mean, a, a girl raised without a father uh, starts her menstruation about a year earlier than a girl raised with a father for the R versus K stuff that I've talked about in the presentation series, Gene Wars, which people should check out if they haven't. But don't let other people running their own bullshit political agendas or financial in, in agendas or tax in, agendas, don't let them tell you when and how you can perform the most astounding feat of creating a nurturing life. Don't let anyone tell you when your eggs should unite with the tadpole. I mean, don't let anyone, don't let anyone do 